Welcome back to another interview with an exciting entrepreneur. And today we have Colton Briner, the founder of Scrappy AF Solutions and Marketing Coach. You want to stay tuned because Colton's going to be sharing some of his best tips on communicating purpose and the importance of creativity and how both of these can really help your business succeed. Colton has spent his entire career where the rubber meets the road between product development and branding on one side and marketing and sales on the other side. This experience has enabled him to combine strong strategies with creative execution to help companies grow fast while spending less, or as he likes to call it, modern marketing with some stank on it. So Colton, yeah. great to have you here. And, you know, I'm all about creativity and I think this is going to be a very creative podcast today. Right on. Thank you so much, Vicki, for bringing me on. So first Colton, I want you to tell our audience a bit about your business, what you do, and more importantly, why you started. Right on. Well, thank you for that. So uh, Scrappy AF is a, a marketing consultancy agency. And what we do is we help um, mid-stage startups. Uh, they'll have somewhere between five and $15 million kind of in their growth. And uh, what we do is we apply strategy and creativity to help them capture market share from deep pocketed industry incumbents. So we help them spend less, right? So, uh, but still get more visibility than um, what those competitors are gaining in their marketplace. I love that deep pocket. Oh yeah. <laughs> because one of the reasons I started my agency is because I looked at all these entrepreneurs that were trying to get their business started and growing. And I've worked with some Fortune 500 companies, multi-million, multi-billion dollar corporations, and they have those deep pockets and they have huge marketing departments. Yes. And I'm like, wouldn't it be great if entrepreneurs could get access to the same level of expertise without having to have an entire floor of your corporate sky rise headquarters Absolutely. as a marketing department. So you're, you've kind of got that same general focus. I love that. I, I totally share your thinking on that. that. More and more, I think people have access to fractional talent uh, as businesses, right? So there's a you know, really talented chief product officer or somebody who's great with technology. And uh, maybe you're not in a position to hire somebody like that full-time, uh, but you'd love to have access to that talent and that they're available as a fractional CMO, CTO, CFO, and uh, you can bring them on for a quarter of their time, right? And still have that kind of access to their talent more and more. That's what I see happening. Yes. And it's a, it's a great way to get that access. Truly. So tell us how your business has grown since you started it and yeah. changed along the way. And especially if COVID has had an impact on that. Right on. Uh, so I would say it's grown quite steadily. Um, so I started actually only just over a year ago. So September of last year. And I was really fortunate to have um, basically every former employer that I'd had uh, was excited to engage me as a consultant at that time. So was really able to get a great leg up right out of the gate. And then in terms of growing since then, consistent visibility on LinkedIn has helped me to uh, you know, attract people who are interested in what I'm doing, trying to either fill very specific gaps that they know they have in their marketing program, or they're looking for someone to help them you know, really kind of comprehensively build out the strategy. Tell me how I can really level up my marketing performance to go after more market share. And uh, it's been cool to, to watch it grow in that way. I get a lot of like word of mouth referrals um, and I really haven't spent on advertising. It's just consistently creating visibility for the expertise that, you know, I've been able to develop over 20 years has made that possible. So curiosity, a lot of people during COVID pandemic quarantine have left the corporate world and started your own business. Was that kind of one of the triggering factors of why you're now an entrepreneur? Um, it, it wasn't. I really was like kind of um, on sort of a scheduled plan that coincided just coincidentally with really that that move to uh, that a lot of people, as you were saying, they took to start their own thing. Um, but it has been it has been useful that so many people sought to kind of break out on their own, hang their own shingle, uh, because those are folks that I really enjoy supporting, right? So folks who are really just trying to figure out how do I get this done? How do I create visibility, craft messaging, differentiate? Uh, you know, th there's so many folks in that space now and it's, that, that lights me up, right? I love to learn about new businesses, love to learn about new products. What are you doing? Why are you passionate about this? And all that stuff really, um, it's, 
it gets me super engaged. So, you know, there's there every day, there's more and more people creating new things and COVID, I think only accelerated that. So this is kind of like my, it's my playground. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I kind of love that you had a planned future yeah. entrepreneurship because so many entrepreneurs get started with their business as kind of a side gig. Sure. And they keep their job while they're building their business to a level where, you know, they feel comfortable to make the leap. And so I, I like that point that it's always okay to have those future plans. And yeah. when it's right, then you kind of take the leap. There was a uh, kind of a philosophy that I followed in every um, employed role that I've held, which I think this is a tip that I would definitely recommend people um, maybe think about this is every, every project or every goal that I aimed for in my employed roles, I, I thought about how would I, how would I aim to make this a portfolio piece for me? You know, whether, whether in this job or for the potential of starting my own job, or, you know, if I, there was the potential for me to seek a new role in a different organization in the future and having that orientation really set me to creating the best things that I could create every time I undertook a project or a deliverable or, or what have you. And that was very powerful in terms of advancing me in the organizations that I was in, right. To quickly get into like C-suite positions where, um, where I was employed. And then, you know, afterwards sort of retrospectively, as I look at having had all those projects serving to build a power por powerful portfolio have put me in a super strong position now that I uh, sort of broke out on my own to start this agency. In all of my past corporate roles, I mm. always told my employees to gather that kind of result. I always told them, because realistically, you have to know that at some point an employee may leave. Even if you don't want them to, you'd love to keep them around forever. Sometimes they need to grow and do something different or yep. go start their own business. Sure. But I always told them, you need to gather all this stuff because if nothing else, it's resume stuff. Yeah. So always a good idea. When you were starting your business, which you said has been just over a year ago. That's right. What were your biggest marketing or business in general kind of struggles that you needed to overcome? Uh, well, first I needed to get uh, a website up and um, this is where I, I did struggle, right? Because yeah, yes, I, I understand I, <laughs> totally when I was working as a, you know, marketing leader and I would have folks bring me copy and content and collateral and whatever, I would have no problem with the red pen. We got to get rid of half of this. Right. And can you tighten this up and really, really say this in um, a really clear and concise way. And then I write my own copy. And somehow every word just got precious, right? Like I don't, I can't, I can't cut this down. I know there's too much. That much I knew, but you know, it was like I, I couldn't cut down my own work. It's like hard to do. So I really had to build this muscle to be able to like look at my own work objectively and then say, all right, this is how we're going to cut this down um, and maintain that discipline because I knew that was the right thing to do. Really condense it. Really keep it clean. Uh, but it took a while. Yeah, it took a while to build that muscle, and then I was able to uh, work. Uh, really closely with my um, web developer to get everything up. And I would say the other thing that was helpful for me in that process was knowing that it wasn't going to be a done thing. It's not a one and done when you build a website, you just have to get started, put something up there and then know that it's going to evolve probably within a week. <laughs> You're going to have <laughs> a thousand things you want to change, right? Take your time. Um, but don't aim for any kind of perfection. It won't be, it cannot be just, just get it up there and start iterating. Let your audience tell you what's resonating and then evolve it over time. I see a lot of people struggle with, it has to be perfect before I put it out or release yeah. it. And yeah. that weight is, you know, one of the worst things you can do. And I always tell new entrepreneurs, one of the first things is you need to have a website of some kind. Yeah. It may not be the $5,000 investment right on day one, but you need to at least do something you can do yourself and get it up and running because it's one of the few pieces of marketing real estate that you own. That's not a third party, get it done, get it up, and then you can fine tune it and you'll be fine tuning it probably forever because not only does that help SEO, but yeah. as you're business, you fine tune kind of your marketing message that I know you're going to be talking a bit about the communication. Hmm. You're going to be fine tuning that as you go. And so you'll need to be updating your website regularly. So I think that's so important, especially the part you said about, uh, you know, being able to really 
to a degree, manage it yourself. What, what tools do you recommend like for hosting and um, site building tools? My favorite is always WordPress, hands sure. down. Yeah. Okay. There's a reason that so many companies across the globe are using WordPress. It's mm -hmm. highly extendable. And the basics of it, you can learn yourself. I actually have a course on it where I walk you through oh, you know, right. how I build $10,000 websites and you can do yourself. But if you aren't quite ready to do that even, start with something super simple like a Google site. Yeah. You gotta have something that you own. That's the important piece. But I love WordPress hosting. Bluehost is one of my clients' favorites. Okay. So that's an easy one. You don't want one of the things I always talk about the website builders where they own the hosting, such as Etsy. I actually had a client come to me. She oh. wasn't a client yet. She was a prospect, came to me and she's like, oh my gosh, help. I don't know what to do. Etsy shut down her high six figure website Ooh. for a silly reason. She was at an Airbnb and the person, I guess, before her sometime had gotten banned by Etsy. And since she used the same IP, it oh, shut down her site. And she appealed it and they said, no, it's our final decision. And she what? had none of her information backed up. She didn't have information on orders in progress, oh, people who man. had paid that she needed to ship to. So you always want to own your own hosting, own your own website, own your own URL. Do not let someone else own those things on your behalf. So true. You need to own them and then let them have access. Yeah. Well, wow, that's a horror story. Oh, my yes. goodness. <laughs> yes. Not the only client who has come to me with a horror story, but hers was one of the worst. And yeah. it took us, it took us, you know, a couple months to get her a website back up and running because she had to start from scratch. Wow. And then it took her about a year to build that business back up because she lost all her customers sure. in like yeah. one day overnight. Oh my goodness. What do you wish someone had told you about? being an entrepreneur before you started your business? Uh, I wish somebody had told me that the occasional bout of existential terror <laughs> uh, doesn't stop because uh, when you're you know, responsible for every part of what you've got going on, right? And uh, every, everything is on you. That, that happens sometimes, right? You just get this like, oh my God, am I doing enough? Oh my goodness, have I thought about everything? Where are my notes? Let me look at my post-its. Where did this one go, right? Like you just have these moments of, Whew, right. Um, it's, it can be uncomfortable. And I think that there's a lot of folks who they haven't gone into entrepreneurship yet. They haven't hung out the shingle. They haven't taken that leap uh, yet. And it's because they have this sense of, oh, I, I'm just, there's a lot of nervousness. I want to wait until I'm, I'm past that. I just want to say, you're not, I mean, don't, don't try to be past it. Um, it's, it's okay. All those things that happen in you are, they're, they're there trying to help. <laughs> they're trying to look out for you. They're trying to keep you alive. Um, but they're part of it, right? Uh, I would say the, the phrase was, uh, don't try to be from it because you can instead be free with it. And I would say, like, I think a lot of what we see on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever it's going to be, everybody looks yeah, calm and collected and they're, they're rocking it and they just got there, but they're all struggling. They all have struggles. Uh, they do a good job of showcasing the best parts, but, you know, we just deal with what we deal with. And I wouldn't want someone to not go into what they're passionate about because they have this false sense of how people are, right? When they're out doing their own thing. Everybody's struggling. Everybody has setbacks. Um, they're just not, we don't have a lot of visibility into that these days. Um, so yeah, I would say be ready to, to leap with it because you're never going to be free from it. I call that with social media, a carefully curated life. Man, right? <laughs> and I see some businesses that are in that kind of, and you'll know what I mean, MLM marketing. Oh, yeah. yeah, sure. Not not in an MLM. They're in a, they do marketing, but what people don't realize is that it's someone else's marketing process that they've learned and they, oh, sure. like, it's just like an MLM. They're paying a fee to them and they're teaching you what that one learned and not yep. teaching you anything else, either because they don't know it or that's all they've learned. They're taught to give a false impression about how great everything's going. Man, right? <laughs> so I totally get that. Yes. Yeah. Follow me. And, you know, I'm a billionaire because of how I do marketing. You'll be a billionaire too. You know what? It, that, that's for the most part, a piece of crap. Sure. 
because every business is different. And what I always say is your business isn't cookie cutter. So your marketing mm -hmm. shouldn't be either. So yeah, you have to remember that people are curating their lives on social media, kind of take that with a grain of salt. You're, you'll have those perfect moments as well, but you'll have all the other ones too, that they're not showing on social media. Do, do you know what I love what you just said about uh, your business isn't cookie cutter um, and your marketing shouldn't be? I think that's really important um, because in particular, whether it's you're trying to find the right program for your marketing, you're trying to find the right program for being purpose-driven, you're trying to find the right program for better internal communication, uh, you know, whatever it is. I mean, there's a hundred things that business leaders want to bring in and improve on. If you outsource those programs, the, the, that initiative, that, that growth, whatever it is to, to a program or a, a consultant that has a program, right? This is my my eight steps to this or whatever it is. My signature program. <laughs> totally right. What, what you've done is you, you have really outsourced the elevation of your organization, right? And it, once that person leaves, once that program goes away, it's like, well, do we need to bring in somebody else now? Rather than, can you bring somebody in who helps with that recognition that your business isn't cookie cutter and then custom builds, like co-builds with you the thing that's going to change your organization? Right. So I learned, I learned a lot of this um, sort of approach from Sarah Armstrong, friend and colleague of mine. And, you know, it's really impacted how I approach a business from the marketing side. I don't have a program. What I have is, you know, 20 years of experience as a marketing executive. I'm not going to tell you that we're going to do eight steps to get you to, to whatever. What I'm going to tell you is we're going to sit down and create this together so that it's yours right? That you are the leader who brought this to your organization rather than this guy over here, this cult guy we hired is going to do this. That's not the way, that's not the way you build it. If you want it sustainable. Exactly. And I always tell new brand new entrepreneurs, if the only way you can get started due to time, your most precious resources, usually time, if it means you're buying someone's eight steps to do whatever, and that's what you need to do when you get started, then that's what you need to do. Sure. I'd rather you do anything than nothing when yeah. marketing your business. But the point I usually come in is when maybe they've done that only once, or maybe they've had to do it a couple of times. And so it's like completely changed things. And sure. I come in at that point when they need to figure out take, how to take what they have existing mm -hmm. and then make it work for their unique needs. So gotcha. start wherever you need to, but then when you're ready to really grow, yeah, exactly. The types of strategies that we use is what you're going to need. Yeah, you'll need to make it yours. So I want you to share a couple of tips now that you have with our audience. And yeah. it's ones that I'm passionate about on communicating your purpose mm -hmm. and the importance of creativity. I'm a creative person, <laughs> sometimes a little too creative and people look at me like I'm crazy, but yeah. you know what? My creativity really works. So let's hear what you have. Sure. Uh, communicating purpose is definitely an area of passion for me. Um, I really believe that in the same ways that things like, I mean, thinking way back, electrification and line manufacturing and then digitization and web 1.0, web 2.0, these shifts define huge swaths of winners and losers in the marketplaces that they were in. And I think purpose is going to do the same thing in the 20s. When we are all empowered as individuals to buy from wherever we want and to work with whomever we want, and even to start our own thing, right? Like I can start my own thing to whatever I want, like tomorrow, you and I are, are proof points on that. Then it becomes a question of, well, if I can buy from anyone, is there someone that I have a, a, an aligned purpose with that they've communicated and I can resonate with? And the same thing as the possibility of being employed by somebody, I can either get a job there, 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 or even start my own where I would be absolutely aligned with purpose, my, my sense of purpose. So what are these people communicating? What are these businesses communicating? And in terms of, uh, you know, communicating purpose, some, some illustrators that help to understand the difference between uh, a platitude and purpose, right? <laughs> so, and then to also be off target for purpose and off targets, actually kind of the more uh, dangerous one that would say that it, it seems to me that Blockbuster Video had in mind that their purpose was renting DVDs. Yes, and it was for a while. <laughs> it was, especially as you saw uh, towards the end, they were getting a, a pretty significant portion of their revenues from late fees. Um, but if they had seen that their purpose was really the entertainment at home business, right? they would have been the ones who had 
invented Netflix, they would have been much, much less susceptible to disruption. Uh, people would have understood them from a purpose level rather than from a transaction level in terms of their relationship with that business. You think of uh, Toro Mower, right? Tor Toro, sorry, the company that makes mowers. If they believe they're in the mower making business, someone who understands that what people want is a beautiful backyard can disrupt them. I mean, somebody's going to invent a laser that cuts your lawn in two seconds, right? So if Toro believes that their business is mowers, whoever comes up with that laser puts them out of business. But if you understand your purposes, they want sanctuary behind their house, then now you are much more aligned with the customer's needs, right? And uh, much less disruptable in the marketplace. So that's, that's where I say that the core tip on this, when you're communicating purpose, is to understand what basic human need you meet with your business. I so agree with the importance of that. I remember way back in my marketing career <laughs> that uh. I've, I've been doing it a decade longer than you. So okay. <laughs> you know, it's been a while. I had a friend who started selling cell phones. And this is back when cell phones were relatively new. Everyone didn't have one. Yeah. And she was going to work in a wireless store. Okay. And what she said to me, she was kind of, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this job. And I was like, why? And she said, I can't sell air because all she was thinking was that, you know, it's invisible communication that flies mm. through the air. And she's oh, like, yeah. I can't sell air. How can I sell air? And, I, and so I set her down. I'm like, wait a minute, you're not selling air. I'm like, you're selling safety between parents and kids. You're selling the ability to call for help if you get stranded in your car. You know, we went through yeah. some of those more kind of basic human needs and quickly shifted her thinking on, okay, I'm not trying to sell invisible air, you know, tech flying through the, <laughs> the yeah. stratosphere or whatever. From that point, I made that one of my priorities to help people focus on, you know, what did, what it is that they're really selling. And one of my, how, how did she do? What happened? Oh, she did great. Yeah. Great. And I mean, she eventually left that and went and did something else. Yeah. Um, but it's because of the skills she had learned there too. Sure really look at what they're selling. Totally. And she became, she's a great salesperson still to this day. But I think back to, I have some pet peeves with some of the cookie cutter marketing. And I talk about these often on my show. Uh -huh. Won't surprise anyone. One of them is everyone says, you have to identify the problem and talk about their problem. Mm. You know, the client's problem. Well, my problem is that I need my lawn mowed. And in that case, I would buy a lawnmower. And if Toro was only looking at my problem, exactly. Their marketing message might be off, yep. not as effective as it could be. I know for people starting out, you know, problem solution benefit, that's kind of an easy structure. Sure. But it's very easy also to go off track a bit because sometimes their surface problem isn't the real emotional need that you could connect with. That's a little bit further down if you go totally. down. Totally. So again, cookie cutter. Can, Here, yeah. Here's the framework, but sometimes you have to get a little bit beyond that. A great place to get you started, cookie cutter, but um, yes. you, you, need to, you need to grow beyond it. Like once you've got started, let's figure out how to grow beyond this. And I think you make a really good point about the focusing on the problem. Yep. There's your, there's your one-on-one. Let's focus on the problem. But uh, if people stop there, they'll miss the opportunity to communicate aspirationally, right? So what problem do you have is a different than what, what goal? Where, where do you want to be, right? There's a different ways to communicate. And then you can go beyond 201 to 301, right? Where you have other, other richer ways to communicate, You're talking about moving up Maslow's hierarchy or what have you. Uh, for people who are focusing or, or want to focus on communicating around needs, I'll just point them in one direction real quick. Uh, if you look up the NVC needs list, really great resource to understand, like get that needs list out, look at it. These are the basic human needs that we all share. Look at it, put it in front of you, use a highlighter. What needs does my company, my product meet for people? That's a great exercise. Good point. And I'll share a link to that actually down in the description. So our audience won't even have to look it up. I'll add that down. Oh, there. great. One of the things I run into with some prospects out there is because they're hearing all of these cookie cutter strategies, mm -hmm. they can't envision these types of tips that you've just shared of what they actually need to be doing instead. Sure. 
Sure. Well, this is, and you know, listening to your podcast is great. This is how people grow beyond the 101, right? Continuous learning, finding the people who are bringing the information beyond uh, what the basics might be, because people can stagnate at the basics. Um, and I get it. Like you had, you got the marketing program off the ground, then you had to focus on operations. You had to focus on growing the business, but circle back, keep circling back across the various, um, departments of your business, whether it's product, whether it's, uh, recruiting, uh, sorry, HR, whatever, but continue to circle back. And here we're circling you back on the marketing side. This is great stuff. Yeah. Constant improvement mm -hmm. in all areas. You do one for a bit and then you move on to a different area of your business and then keep coming back around to it. Absolutely. So let's talk about one of my favorite topics, which oh. if my Zoom background wasn't on oh. when I talked about this at the beginning, yes, all of my artwork, not all of it, but a lot of it is on the wall behind me. And there's so much of it that it's distracting. So I put my Zoom background in so that you won't be distracted. I love bringing creativity mm. also, not just in my own life, but to businesses. I think it's important in business and you have some tips on this. So I'd like you to share your tips with our audience. Right on. I appreciate that. I, I think that um, there's been a kind of a pretty well-known and accepted practice for businesses to invest in their employees' physical health, right? We just, we've seen this, right? So it's either uh, great healthcare programs or fitness programs where they have gyms in their offices or they do, you know, like the, uh, the, the company run. That's all great. Um, but there's a, there is something else that anyone can develop, not in a similar way that you can develop your physical fitness is you can develop your creative capacities. It's not something that oh, I'm just born with, or that person just has, it's, it's something that anyone can build. I really believe that there's maybe three to five things that are probably like emotional IQ, right? EQ, whatever creativity can enhance every function of business. And there's very few things that, that a person can have or develop that can enhance every function of business. So I really want to encourage businesses to um, invest in the creative capacities of their teams. And there's lots of ways to do this, right? There's, um, you can look up creative exercises and that type of thing. It's also in uh, building creative environments, not, not hard to do, right? So how do you, like messy desks are actually pretty creative um, or <laughs> green, green walls, like in the office, literally just having a, a green wall or that you have built in a break structure yes. that allows the mind to do that, that digesting of ideas uh, or concepts to come up with ideas, make space for creativity to occur in your organizations. There's lots of, uh, of tactics for encouraging creativity and building up the capacity of your employees in terms of their creativity. I actually have a resource, how to become the most creative person in the room. Uh, which is available on my website. Anybody can download that. It's 10 tools and tactics for building up your own creativity. These aren't as well understood. I mean, if you want to become a marathoner, you know, you just got to get out there and, and run. Maybe you're going to do some, uh, some leg uh, weight training. Everybody kind of knows that. The exercises for building creativity are less well known, but there's great scientific evidence that this stuff really works. And if you can just get a little rigor going around regularly doing these things, your creative capacities are going to go way up. I think one of the opportunities that so many companies miss is giving their staff kind of a little bit of that mental downtime mm -hmm. to foster creativity. And yes, there's benefits to, you know, walking out in nature and yes, yes. all these other things you can do, maybe kind of like just yoga or meditation to kind of relieve the mind of, you know, the busyness, but totally having that mental downtime is so critical to creativity. And there's still businesses that are stuck in, you must be at your desk eight to five, right? Yeah. You get a 30 minute or an hour lunch, but you need to be at your desk. Yep. And I expect you to be, you know, typing on your keyboard the whole time. And that doesn't foster creativity. And no. the creativity is actually the thing that will allow your employees to come up with so many new ideas that can yep. take your business to the next level very quickly. And it's that assembly line mentality where, you know, people have to be there and it has to be done the same way right. all the yes. time. And that's great to an extent, but right. it cuts out creativity in the people doing that work. And it, you can still have creativity in some of the other people, but if we allow all of the people around us to access that creativity, wow, I mean, you can't even imagine, you can't imagine today where your business could be tomorrow if 
creative things happen. It's- I, I think it's the, uh, the killer advantage. I, I really think yes. it's, it's how business is because the combinatorial possibilities are coming out of the walls now. And the businesses that have a little bit of creativity are going to take advantage of that raw material and just make leaps over their competition. Um, somebody who's just sort of sitting still and not investing in the creativity of their team, not encouraging innovation from within, they're going to get eclipsed. <laughs> Well, we're going to share the link where people can download how to become the most creative person in the room right? from your website. So we will share that. So now it's your turn to ask a question or two, Colton. Uh, anything you want to ask me about me, my business, my marketing, yeah. ask me anything. I'm actually really excited to hear you articulate your purpose. My purpose really revolves around helping entrepreneurs grow to the next stage of their business yeah. while keeping it easy for them mm. and efficient. The reason that I want to help them grow is so that they have the freedom and flexibility to do all of those other important things in their life. Oh, wow. Yeah. Your business is a way to make all of those things in your life happen. Mm-hmm. And if we help you put it all together, just right, focused efficiently, We can help you get there so that your business succeeds at feeding all of those important pieces of your life. Yeah, really using your business as um, a tool. It's a tool, a creative tool, a helpful tool, a financial tool, but it doesn't have to be an 80 hour a week, every week (laughs) tool. We don't, what, we don't want it to be that. You need some life. <laughs> truly, you do. What, what market areas, business areas, um, tech, otherwise, what, what lights you up? What markets light you up? My passion clients are huh. ones that do have a purpose. And the purpose is bigger than just their business. I like helping companies make a difference. A lot of my background for uh, about 10 years was in the nonprofit world. Yeah. And you kind of get addicted to that, really making an impact in people's lives. And so when I have clients that have a business that makes some level of, you know, significant impact, yes, that's really exciting that I get to keep doing that, not only for their business, but for all the people that they touch and they impact. And it's like, I get to exponentially help so many people that way sure. that I love being part of that and helping those businesses really achieve their person, purpose and passion to yeah. help all those people. Ooh, purpose and passion. Yes. Person. <laughs> I made it work. <laughs> oh, like uh, have you uh, uh, seen uh, on the nonprofit side, there was a, there was a Ted talk that I loved. I think it was by Dan Pelota. Um, and he was talking about, we've been thinking about nonprofits just all wrong. Do you know that, do you know the talk I'm talking about? Is that the one where he's saying that we kind of want nonprofits to have a scarcity mentality and that's not the best way to do it? That's right. That's right. That's the one. Love that yes. talk. Really, yes. really thought that was very insightful. That's how we ran the nonprofits that, um, I was running and helping run because similarly you can help more people, which is the whole goal of a nonprofit by not expecting nonprofits to lack. Totally. So you don't want, you know, if you, if you want good people to be employed by the nonprofit, you need to pay well. Now that may not mean a seven figure salary. You know, a lot of people come into nonprofits because of the purpose and Mm -hmm. they trade off some pay because of the difference they get to make sure, all of the people yeah. in nonprofits. I know they're not expecting the really huge salaries. They give a little on that so that they can make a difference, yeah. but it doesn't mean that they want to make $8 an hour uh-huh. <laughs> for doing high level work. So right. yeah, to attract the talent that's going to help the nonprofit help more people, totally, you have to invest some in those resources Nonprofits doesn't mean that they're not allowed to make a profit. Right. Yeah. It just means that the profit has to roll back into the organization. Yep. That's a big shift that some of the nonprofits I've had to work with have had to make. Oh, we're not allowed to make a profit. We're a nonprofit. No, that is not true. Yeah. Profit is not a bad thing, even for a nonprofit, as totally. long as the profit is going back into the organization to create more ability to help more people. 100% agreed. Before we, wrap up. Yeah. I want you to share how our audience can reach you and we will share your links down in the description, wherever they're watching or listening to this. But if they don't want to look, 
Yeah. Give us your links. Yeah, right. I'm, we'll do that. Um, so scrappyafsolutions.com. That's my website. Easy to reach me there. Um, and I, I definitely welcome anyone who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love the connections are just pouring in now. So this has been really exciting. Great conversations happening. I think there's only one Colt Briner on LinkedIn. If you find another one, you let me know. I'm gonna have to talk to that person. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's it's LinkedIn is kind of where I focus uh, just in terms of the businesses that I'm trying to reach. It's been really, really powerful for me. So yeah, that's that's where to find me. Any last comments? Just go do it. Get started. Get started and and let it be let it be okay, whatever it is, and just keep on going. Um, the concern that you may have, the fear that holds you back, it's gonna be there. It's it's trying to help you. Give it a hug. <laughs> Say thanks and and get started. And that is actually one of the best ways to overcome fears and obstacles is by kind of leaning into them and uh -huh. letting it be okay. Yep. It's been so great to have you here and share some of your best advice and tips. And for our audience, as always, if you have any marketing questions, you're welcome to visit my website, vickywoo.marketing. Bottom right corner, there is a chat bubble icon and you can ask your question there. I'll either answer you directly and sometimes I may even use your question on an upcoming episode. While you're here, check out our other videos and subscribe to our channel so that you never miss the latest marketing tips.